What is good, y'all? It's Chanel, also known as Tuba Fresh, coming at you today with the project I've been teasing at you for the last couple weeks. Um, I'm so excited to bring you the first episode of a new series called Hustle and Horns. Now, this is a collaboration with the homies Andrew Hitz and Lance LeDuc. You know them, the Brass Junkies, right? So we're doing a collaboration with them and this, this video and all these videos, or this whole series is gonna be a Pedal Note Media production, which I'm happy to say I love those guys and they, you know, kind of gave me the opportunity to go ahead and do a series on YouTube and I'm, I'm so excited about it, you know? They kind of took me out of my comfort zone. The whole idea of this series is to try and get to know the brass musicians of Los Angeles. You know, I recently moved out here. It was a great idea on Andrew's part. And it, I think it kind of pushed me to say, you know what, I need to get to know more folks. We're in the middle of a pandemic. How do you do that? There's kind of no better way to do that than sit down and talk to someone. And this is exactly what I did. I sit down and talk to fine musicians here out in LA. It's brass musicians, musicians that do all sorts of things. And I'm just so excited to bring this series to you. Um, right now, I think we're gonna release these videos bi-weekly. I'll shout out the dates on um, other videos that I have coming up. But this one is really special to me because it's the first one. And also, it's my homie Todd Simon. Now, a lot of you may know Todd Simon already, but you know, when I was coming out here, a lot of people told me, hey, you need to connect with Todd Simon. And he's really the guy. So let me read to you a little bit of Todd's bio. You're gonna find out a whole heap of stuff about Todd in this video. But if you are a, lo a young listener, someone who's trying to think, you know, where, where, where should I go? Where's my next move? After like going through and editing this video, he gave us quite a few gems and it's really worth taking in. I mean, right in this episode, we talk about, you know, how do you go about talking to, you know, high profile artists about pay? We go ahead and we talk about his upbringing, you know, how it is that he became so musically influenced from all over the world. I mean, and, and how did he become such an amazing arranger? Take some tea, you know, sit back, watch the whole thing. You, you won't regret it. Todd Sam is a multi-instrumentalist. He plays trumpet, he plays French horn, he plays a ton of stuff, he plays keyboards. He's also a composer and arranger and performer and educator living in Los Angeles. He was born and raised here. But I think the thing about him is that he is a Los Angeles go-to guy. I mean, for horn arrangements, string, string arrangements, you've heard him on records, you've heard him on TV shows, on films. I mean, he's just everywhere. And he's the guy that you call if you want a dope band, a dope arrangement in your recording session. And Getting to know him has been really humbling. He's done so much stuff and he's just such a humble guy, um, you know, but he knows what he's doing and he knows his worth and it's a beautiful thing to see. He's really someone that you need to get to know as well. Um, and it's best been, we had a great conversation, you'll see. Um, and I just love talking to Todd and I can't wait to show you all the gems that he put into this episode. I mean, if there's anyone to talk about music business with and kind of like the landscape of how we do things, he's really the one to go to. And Todd has just been such a sweet guy talking to me and helping me uh, come out here and be on my journey out here in Los Angeles. Any little questions that I have, I text him and he always responds and kind of just, you know, gives me information, tells me keep on going. So I love, you know, talking to Todd and I'm so happy and I'm, you know, it's a pleasure for me to introduce to you and to share with you our conversation on the first episode of this brand new series called Hustle and Horns. And I want to introduce Todd Simon. All right, so we have Todd Simon here. Now, Todd is one of the first people that people hooked me up with when I was said I was moving out to LA. They said, Todd is the guy, he knows everyone out there, and also he just has a map to everything that's going on. And not only that, he's a father. And it was kind of a cool thing that people were like, oh, you have a son. And, you know, then Todd has a, little, a girl and Todd has a kid. So it was kind of this kind of combination of you're both brass players. You're both interested in different kinds of things. And you have a family, you know, like it's, it's hard to be a musician or it's interesting to be a musician 
and raise a family at the same time. So, you know, it's kind of like, it was a cool spot because I felt like I didn't have to explain myself in terms of like, I'm a mom, uh, but you know, I still play, I'll still play gigs, you know? So Todd was one of the first people that when I said, hey, uh, I asked my friends, especially Sly, Sylvester, I reached out to him and I was like, hey, I know you've traveled a lot, you know, do you know any folks in LA? And he's the first person he said was Todd Simon. And I've been talking to Todd for quite a bit, like since I moved here, just on text messages, on phone conversations, and it automatically, I could just feel like he's a really warm guy. And honestly, after going through and doing a lot of research on him, he seems like a really, really humble guy. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think that's just what I get gathered from just talking to him and just he's been telling me just keep on doing keep on doing your thing and you know just to list a few these are the people that he's played with but not only does he play with these people he has arranged orchestrated composed for folks just like these folks I'm just going to name a few people like Solange, CeeLo Green, TV and the Radio, Angelique Kijo, Ziggy Marley, Santago, Flying Lotus, Khalees, Quantic, and not only that, is he a trumpet player? He also is a multi-instrumentalist. He plays French horn, of course, all the other kinds of trumpet, flugel horn, things like that. Um, but he composes and he writes for film and TV and video games and he DJs. I mean, I think for horn players, for brass players, I think for me, uh, someone like Todd just kind of wraps up what I think we can be doing as brass players, you know, um, a multitude of things. So anyhow, I said I wasn't going to do a big introduction. I kind of did a big introduction, um, but let's get into it. Hey, Ty, welcome to Hustle and Horns. I'm so excited to have you here. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm real happy to be here chatting with you and um, wish we could do it in uh, real life, but this is, uh, this is a good way to do it too. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, Zoom has been one of those things where you kind of like you love it and you hate it because you're on it so long every day but then when you get to have conversations like this and not how it be like work related you're just kind of like more relaxed more relieved that you're doing something kind of fun mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um so i just wanted to get in with you uh about your upbringing you are from los angeles you're from the neighboring city from where i live you're from culver city right the Culver City area over where uh, Culver City and uh, Venice uh, meet up. Technically the Mar Vista area, but uh, West Side, West LA native. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, I'm a New York native, so I get that feeling like when you're, when you're from cities on coastal areas, you kind of have this like huge attachment to it. Um, so you're born and raised here. Um, you play here, you raise your family here, you, you, I mean, this has been your hub. I mean, for the, for the most part, you went to school here, right? Um, yeah. So how about like, just give us a little bit of insight on your high school days, like how maybe your middle school days, how you got into playing horn or playing instruments and kind of walk us through that from there to maybe college. Yeah, it, it really even stems back to my elementary school days. I went into elementary school uh, being a music fanatic. Um, my mom's radio player and turntable was my favorite toy as a kid and um, played around a lot with singing and with my grandmother's piano and was real fortunate at uh, my elementary school at Grandview Elementary School. Um, we had Mrs. Rosenberg, who's this, um, very old but very spunky and enthusiastic and energetic uh, music teacher who she's a choral director and um she really took to me and um just really exposed so much music to me at an early age that it really um sparked even a, a further love and dedication to music for the fun of it and um they it was, it's a LAUSD school, LA Unified School District. So the, that school also had a band program and I joined that and started playing the trumpet and um, just uh, immediately fell in love with that instrument. And um, combined with my vocal ability, applying that musicality to my trumpet, I just um, continued on and uh, was luck luckily to uh, 
meet up with Paul Salvo, who was my first private trumpet teacher. He's a, a New York native, but a, a staple in the LA um, recording scene and um, just a real amazing, sweet, motivated, very tough um, private teacher that really uh, molded me to be the musician that I am today. And I'm real grateful to him. And um, through everyone in my elementary school, just uh, encouraged me to go to Palms Junior High, uh, which luckily my grandparents lived there. So I used their address to get that, uh, get into that school. And that's always still is a uh, powerhouse uh, in the West LA area for um, band program. And um, I dedicated so much time in, element, in uh, junior high where I was uh, practicing in the band room during nutrition and lunch. And um, really, um, I, I, that's where I think I got a lot of my hours in, if you uh, are into the outliers. You know, I, I, think I, I think I got to my 10,000 hour in um, eighth or ninth grade. So uh, really like dedicated. By skipping lunch, huh? Yeah, just like get on that horn. And um, I still, there's some people, there's some people in the music industry that went to that school with me and they have some funny stories about me being a real, your typical trumpet player, <laughs> uh, being real hard on everybody. And, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm, I'm proud to have gotten that out of my system at an early age of that. I, I actually call myself the anti-trumpet player and, uh, um, and Palms is a feeder school into uh, Hamilton, but you still have to audition for Hamilton Music Academy, uh, where I went to high school. And, um, you know, that's where Kamasi Washington went, uh, Mike Elizondo, um, John Diversa, um, Double K, uh, rest in peace from People Under the Stairs. There's like a huge hip hop scene there. And, um, Scarab, Merce, like a lot of insane rappers and DJs were there. And then just a, a huge amount of just the most insanely talented musicians. It was like a music boot camp. Uh, it's like a specialized school. It's like, yeah. Specialized yeah. art school. Mm. Yeah, it's a, like, a, like a music, mag, a performing arts magnet. So, uh, sorry. It's, Oh, it's okay. Uh, oh, don't worry uh, about it. The, um, yeah, so it's an audition-based school uh, for the whole school district. Kids are getting bussed in from the furthest realm of the West Valley, kids from um, East LA, what, where whoever's in the school district are there. So it's just the best of the best, um, really competing for that first chair competing for that scholarship, competing to get the attention of special guests and stuff. And um, I, I'm, I'm forever um, grateful for that school, for the directors, um, for those other trumpeters that made me, you know, have to outdo them. Yep. And uh, for those beboppers that made me get into want to get into other music other than that stuff and um, really um, unreal, like an unforgettable experience in high school. Um, it's like fame or like LaGuardia High in yeah. New York and, um, and um, so many friendships uh, based out of it. So many friendships from students that went there after I graduated, like Kamasi or um, Thomas Sweeney, Khalil Cummings, Evan Greer, like three amazing talented percussionists and drummers who went to school at the same time wow. as Kamasi that um, are forever a part of uh, who I feel I am as a musician. So just uh, um, an amazing place, still is. It's a powerhouse. So that's um, crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of like LaGuardia and stuff like that, where it's just kind of like all the baddest cats are there. They're all just competing and getting the, I mean, it's, it's, it's great. I mean, if you can handle it, it's great. Right. Yeah. Uh, if yeah. You're, it, it's a lot. If, right. If you're ready for that kind of push is great.
Yeah. So that's crazy. So you went to high school with people like Kamasi Washington, all kinds of crazy cats, and they're pushing each other. And I, I like what you said, the people that also inspired you to listen outside, because you initially was, you were doing mostly classical at that point, right? Maybe in high school. So going to school with all these other people, not only musicians, but maybe people that like, uh, was vocalists, you know, singers, rappers, whatever, they introduce you to, the, or dancers, they introduce you to different kinds of music. And how did that really, how do you feel like that moment in high school? How do you feel it? Because you are, I mean, I think most people probably know you now as a jazz musician. So how did that, how did high school kind of help to kind of change the wheels or the cogs? I mean, was it high school or was it a little bit later? No, it, it actually was like going into high school, I, I wanted to really uh, dig deep into jazz at that point. I was definitely on the trumpet working um, classically um, and my chops were like insane. Like I, I don't think my chops are as good as they were, you know, going into 10th grade, um, but um the uh, definitely um, my enthusiasm and uh, wonderment for other types of music out there um, really got heightened from the friendships uh, that I made in high school, um, really getting turned on to uh, the acid jazz movement um, really blew my mind. Um, these are artists like DJ Greyboy and his, the ensemble that came out of his crew called the Gray Boy All Stars, out, um, they're out of um, San Diego, um, or the New York movement, like the Groove Collective via Giant Steps. Like I was really um, tuning into what was coming out of those scenes. Um, in addition to hip hop, uh, my brother um, is a huge hip hop enthusiast and um, I was really against it at the time because it was, um, I just thought that the art of sampling was not cool and was um, against what was going on in jazz. And luckily he really pushed me in my, in, by being exposed to acid jazz through some friends. And then my brother pushing the um, Black Sheep album onto me really blew my mind. I was like, wait, this, this is jazz, it's like, it's another form of jazz. And I really uh, fully embraced it. And um, through that, through the digging of records, samples, breaks, I just fell in love with hard bop and spiritual jazz. And um, while the other kids were getting into bebop and Charlie Parker, and there was always the divide of listening to uh, Miles's kind of blue there's the the kids that liked Cannonball and the kids that liked John Coltrane on that record. And um, I remember getting into fights and debates over all that stuff and being real stern, you know, about it. Um, but it's funny because a lot of people don't don't like to call me as a jazz musician, even in LA, like the LA jazz scene really never um, supported me nor embraced me and I always felt like I was going against the grain and um, because of my love for the more um, spiritual elements of it and the more international influence in jazz, I was always into um, Cuban jazz. And um, at, in high school, I fell in love with Ethiopian jazz and um, later on getting really into the jazz around Panama and Colombia, and um, so, and then Brazil. So it just like expands on and on and on. And I'm I'm not mad one bit. Like I'm don't want to be a LA jazz musician. Like I I want to be the the musician that I am. I want to be me. I don't like I want to follow in the footsteps of Duke Ellington and like really um, be myself and not fit into a box and stuff. So. Um, you know, the, those friendships and even I'm, I, I always say I'm grateful to the kids at, in high school that, um, that did push me and did debate with me and stuff. Like if it wasn't for that friction, I would not be who I am as a musician today. 
And um, some of those kids don't like the trumpeters, they don't even play trumpet anymore. But I'm grateful that they did back then because I wouldn't work so hard to be who I am as a as a brass musician. So it like, like I said, unforgettable experiences in like, you know, being in LA, you know, like if you grew up in New York, you like where we're, we have so much available, so many resources and um, me being a, a educator as well. Like I'm always telling my students like LA is in your backyard. Like you have everything at your disposal. Like you got it, like take advantage of it because there's kids in the middle of nowhere that are that want like a speck of what we can do. Yep. So, you know, like I, I, I learned it early just to take advantage of all the resources, everyone in all the networks of everybody that I was connecting with and, um, and that, that's who may, makes me who I am. Yeah, and talking about, you know, network, I mean, a lot of people, contribute like their network or you know their group of friends or their group of musicians that they call frequently a lot of them contribute to getting all that in college years you know like really you know to a lot of people moving across country or to a different state means that they build their connections there and they kind of feel like they have to stay there because this is where the connections are i mean i know you went um to cal arts and do you feel that because it seems like um because you know, we'll get into this later, but you told me to go ahead and look up the West Coast Get Down. And, uh, and I was like, hmm, I, I haven't heard about this movement before, but then I really have because I've heard about all these characters, all these folks separately, but I didn't, I didn't hear about them really together and how it kind of all formed. And you were talking about high school. So it seems like even in high school, you started those relationships quite early. Uh, what about college? You know, what about uh, conservatory years? I mean, how did that influence you and kind of networking and, and, and finding all of these people? Because you are a creator, like you said, like Duke Ellington, you, which I love about you, which because I, I love doing the same things, like you create bands, you know, you, uh, you're creating certain standards for what kind of you can do as a musician or an artist, right? So how did college kind of, you know, influence that? Um on so many different levels. Um, in my junior and senior years of high school, I was already gigging in a lot of bands and around town. And so by the time I got to CalArts, I was a working musician. I, um, into the end of the first semester, um, quit my main day job. I worked, I, I worked full time through high school and wow. into, um, I did um, study, you know, like a study work thing at CalArts to pay, pay my way through. But I had a day job as well, and I'll never forget I, the time when I was able to quit my main day job to really put more time into music and gigging, because I, I started gigging a lot um, and making money doing gigs. This was yeah. in the mid-90s where you could make an easy $300 for playing um, three sets of a salsa gig or yeah. doing some other things. And um, so uh, the work ethic um, and really refining that um, changed my life forever. Uh, learning how to work your butt off and not sleep was a big part of it. Mm -hmm. And so with all that, tying into I just was all over the city all over CalArts um, making friends meeting people playing with whoever I could play with um, that was profound and um, a great way to master our craft by uh, just seeing what different types of musicians are there what different types of music we can play as a as a horn player um, I was real lucky to work with uh, Wadada Leo Smith. He was my main mentor at CalArts. Um, I went there under the uh, realm of getting a mass, uh, bachelor's in jazz trumpet. So they had me with Clay Jenkins as well. And uh, I love you, Clay. Clay is great. But um, again, he I wasn't that like I was not 
conforming into that box of a bebop trumpet player and uh, Leo Smith really um, helped me with that. He really guided me and um, like really embraced the music that I was loving, pushing what he's doing with Ankh Rossumation and creative uh, improvised music was, uh, was a wonderful way to um, tap into our inner selves during that time, like the college years for CalArts is ama was amazing at that time because a lot of us came into it already um, established in our craft. Like um, yeah. if you're familiar with the saxophonist Zane Musa, um, he, he's he's passed away unfortunately, but he we're the same age and um, we act in the '90s. You didn't go straight into CalArts from high school. They it was more for like an older clientele. And um, we kind of broke the mold. And um, so we were super young. And then after us, Tony Austin from the West Coast got down. Mm -hmm. He ended up coming in as well. And um, we, Leo um, grabbed a hold of us and was like, this is your time to really find out who you are as a person yeah. through music. Um, and really pushing us like don't play other people's music you play your music and like really like that that really um, stayed within me even though I ended up working in pop music and spending a lot of my time ending up playing a lot of other people's music but using that to fuel um, my love and and the things that I wanted to do with uh, fellow musicians. Yeah, I mean, that's a huge message to get at that age, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's such, because like most of us, no matter if you're playing classical or jazz, you're there and you're playing other people's music. You're in a conservatory and you're playing other people's charts. You're playing other people's compositions. I mean, so for a teacher or for a mentor to tell you, hey, this is your time to get to know people, get to know who you are, write, create your own stuff. I mean, I think at that age, it's such a special thing to hear that voice because uh, most of us, you know, at the, around that time, we're not hearing that, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's really special. I mean, thank goodness for mentors. I mean, that, that tell us different things, you know? Mm -hmm. It was unreal. And, um, Dave Reutstein, he's the Dean of the Jazz School. He was really uh, gracious in um, sharing with uh, arranging and that just like blew my mind um, how to write a chart properly, how to voice horns. Like he was so incredible about it. And then they would provide like, Every year we'd get to go to Capitol Studios and record original content and like that, like right, right there is like, like priceless. Yeah. And so those experiences are amazing. Like I got to record in Capitol on a song with, with Wadada Leo Smith. It was like, wow. Yay. And then like, um, Charlie Hayden was still there and, um, built a, a wonderful relationship with him such an incredible talent and um, um through my urgency and bugging him forever he brought back um the liberation music orchestra um under like i got to help him out with that and we did a performance for the opening of the getty center up um and so like experiences like that like some real like always colleges provide like the professional experience for um for their students but these were like legit like yeah like you're like you're doing this and you know all eyes on you and um that really um instilled in me like that i have this fearless thing about music and um, yeah. who i work with and pushing myself and finding ways like I'm always looking for a challenge and never want to feel good with myself when I feel comfortable in in my life as an artist like I am always like I want that challenge you know and um that's, that's dope. the thing yeah that's dope I mean I feel like you know this this is exactly like I, I got I got so many questions for you but 
I feel that that challenge to like find yourself in those challenging moments, it, it either can be far and few between or it can be consistent, right? And it's really your, for the most part, you're in control of that, right? Mm -hmm. Because you could say no, you could say, you know what, I'm not comfortable with that. I don't really do that. And, you know, I feel the same way. I just started feeling like I'm saying yes to uncomfortable things or being honest about it, being like, hey, oh, hey, can we like blah, 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 you know, can you feel comfortable scoring? You know, I'm like, well, I just started learning how to do this. I don't feel comfortable, but I'm happy to learn. Mm -hmm. And I think like it's so important, you know, I'm realizing now that it's so important to like be honest, say, hey, this is where I'm at, but I'm totally comfortable to try and fail, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that when you said that, I mean, to have that realization, you know, uh, at, you know, that you're okay being put in uncomfortable places. I mean, that a, I think, kind of gears up a, a space for collaboration, which you've done a lot of. Yeah. And because I want to ask you about that, but, but before collaboration, I want to ask you because you talked about arranging. Um, you know, as a horn player, and I feel like a lot of horn players out there, they kind of, you know, get to a certain point and they think, I, I, I love writing my own music, but how do I arrange for horns well? And how, and you're really going through arranging strings. You know, you've arranged strings for people like Macy Gray. I mean, a ton of people you worked on Schoolboy Q's album. I mean, so there's so much, there's so much that you've done, but like, how do you go from being a trumpet player let's i guess let, let's keep it i mean like, i know you have vocal background too but how do you go from being a trumpet player to doing big arrangements and arranging strings i mean i think people will want to hear about that who are interested and in maybe kind of figuring out how they can do that as well yeah i i just um jumped at it at the opportunity you know like mm -hmm. uh, being in a situation where um you know, you got to trust the person that you're working with. But if I'm on a was on a session early on for doing horns, and I'm hearing something that like I like how it all went down is I was working on a on a song and was like, this can really use some strings, and I think like a a string arrangement would be pretty nice. And like, do you know anybody who could do it? And I'm like, yeah, me. And yeah, like, oh, yeah. okay, let's like, <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> I, this was before I was on finale. I was writing charts by hand and, wow. uh, you know, luckily I had taken some orchestration classes and had practiced and learned, you know, working with the yeah. real string section, um, but just going for it and really kind of being like, I don't like, I know really good string players, but I've never done this in the studio, but like, I'm going to go for it and just do the best I can in it. And in those situations, it just, um, I, I thrived and uh, mm -hmm. learned so much. You have to learn and be open to those experiences really quick. And you have to have that reflex to know what's right and wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and it just like spawned off from there. And it like, I'm jealous of the kids today because you can temp up an arrangement in garage band, soundtrack, band lab and hear it immediately where back then like, we, did, we didn't have that. You you were lucky if you could afford a um, keyboard that you can do some like multi-track sequencing on and stuff. That's right. stuff was really expensive in the 90s. And yeah. like now you can do it for free. And yeah. uh, so um, I'm always pushing uh, younger musicians to, to play around. Like, yeah, stack up a chord and then take a note and move it in listen to what Duke Ellington had to ha say about it, how he wrote for Harry Carney on baritone sax as if he was playing a soprano sax and taking instruments out of their elements and wow. coming up with different textures. And like, that's always been, for me, it's, it's a hobby. Like mm -hmm. always writing charts was fun, even by hand back in the day for large scale mm -hmm. groups, um, working out uh, harmonies within sections or orchestra like I I love playing around with them real um, in awe of our mutual friend um, Sly Fitab he's like he can arrange things where um, things bounce off of each other and move around and like um, just always like it to me it's there it's uncharted territory there's still things that 
have not been done in arranging and orchestration. And um, in the studio, there's so much we can do with it. And yeah. uh, it's all about being flexible and finding the right musicians to play arrangements who can also be flexible because if they aren't, then you're confined into what's on the paper and you might be like, ah, actually move that around and, and um, play with it. Because I'll, I'll be honest, like I, I'm much better now. Like I know exactly what I want, how to get it on a piece of paper and get a musician to play that. But for the first like 12, 15 years of doing it, I was like freestyling it, like for wow. real. Like I'd come in with the chart, but I'd be so open to different things. And yeah. you know, this is even on like scoring, like, you know, recording stuff for a movie composer, like some high stakes stuff, but just mm -hmm. like, just going for it. Yeah. And I'm pretty like, I'm not like that in my personal life, but so for some reason in music, like I'll take a chance, like I'll yeah. go for it. And, um, a lot of a lot of horn players, string players, you know, people who grow up in a classical setting, it feels mm -hmm. like a lot of us are afraid to take those chances. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it's I think it's scary because you're out of your comfort zone. Yeah. And I think people get caught up that they are a certain thing. They mm -hmm. are a horn player, they are a conductor. And I think when people see that you are trying to do so much or you're trying to open up I think what you can do, I think. It, it's nerve-wracking for some people and I love that I love the ability to say you know I can do a bunch of things I'm not just a tuba player and I think being a tuba player I, I feel like and maybe other horns as well is that you do feel this kind of confinement in a sense mm -hmm. and I think it is unlike um playing different instruments because you're kind of you're kind of in this you know strange under you know undercurrent of things right mm -hmm. so i feel like as a tool player I, I, it was really helpful for me and my like kind of like uh, musical stamina to keep on going keep on being in music keep on doing music to explore different things artistically you know even if it's like really crappy until yeah. like you said it you kind of take years to figure it out and then for like sometimes 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 click and you kind of get into it or it just kind of took that long to kind of figure out how you do it you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that's like, it's so important, you know, to kind yeah. of widen your perspective. Yeah, especially um, horn players, it, for instrumentalists, like you, to be successful in music, you have to wear multiple hats. Like that is like, there's no, especially not, there, there's no way we can make a living playing our instruments, which is, it's, it's really sad and tragic. Because uh, there was a time where that was, but we were just born in the in the wrong generation for that. So to make up for it, we we have to do other things. And luckily, in music, there is so many different things that we can do. You just got to put some time into it and dedicate some less of your practice time on your main instrument to do some other things to hone in on the craft for that. Exactly. So I want to get into this because like the arranging and the composing, right? You've worked with a ton of people, producers, fun notice. Like, what's it like being in the studio or in conversation with these folks that have like a kind of pretty clear idea of where their song is going off or where the album is going? And then you come in like midway through and you're writing out a horn chart or you're writing out a string arrangement or you're kind of helping them compose from the ground up. I mean, how does that work and how, like, how, what's some advice that you would give to in collaboration with others, like, you know, high profile artists that you come in there and you kind of have to know the sweet spot, right? You kind of have to know kind of how, how, how to walk the walk. You kind of, you got to know how to do your job really well, probably really quickly, but you kind of have to know how to talk to folks, right? It's, 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 it's a combination of things. It's like, you, you got to know what you came in there to do but it's also about being, you know, kind of amiable, right? Or sure. figuring out how this person works versus that person, right? Yeah, it takes some element of uh, psychology in a way, because um, um, anybody on like a high profile artist, uh, they could be the most super friendly um, 
you know, person, or they can be completely opposite and not know how to communicate properly in, in a musical or even just a social setting. So um, you really have to be sensitive to the, the situation, um, know um, when to step in and be super friendly and like get in with them and like have a conversation or know like, oh, they're not really um, on that tip right now. They're dealing with some inner stuff. So you gotta be sensitive to that. Um, but that sensitivity is definitely gets you somewhere. And um, it says a lot about who you are. So you can't, for me, I can't even start making music with somebody unless I get into that. Like I need some connection or at least to know what is, um, how it's gonna go down like that. And you can usually read it right off the bat when you first meet that person, you know? Um, so that's like a, a huge thing to me that um, I had to learn real quick when I started, you know, doing sessions in studio with artists like that. Um, for the musical level and the creative level, again, you have to be real sensitive. And um, I've always been one to, I, um, I do not like to record anything unless it's coming from my heart. Mm -hmm. And I'm real fortunate and grateful that the majority of the work that I've done as a musician is where I'm able to do that. I'm not playing what somebody else is telling me to do. Obviously, if that happens, I will do it. Um, but, um, and I'll, I'll make it, I'll communicate that with them. Like I'm not going to um, force anything unless it's coming from a pure place. And um, that always resonates real strong with everybody in the studio unless it's somebody who knows what they want and that's what they what they want you to do. And then we step back and play the part and it's cool. But um, everybody is usually into and open to suggestions, especially us as horn players. If we're brought in to record for an artist uh, or a producer, um, sometimes they don't really know the musical language like we do and they, we can hear something that they're not hearing. And it's always, if you're doing it from a friendly place, a caring um, space to um, bring something else to the table, do it. Yeah. Uh, you'll, you should, some people, I, we've all been in sessions where there's someone that's always like pushing these ideas and they're not reading the, the communication from everybody else, like chill out, we got it. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's 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 a delicate dance and um they'll either know exactly what they want or they might know a vibe mm -hmm. or they might not know at all what they want but that they want some jazzy horns on it you know <laughs> <laughs> or some i bet that the funny thing in the late 90s was uh, that's too jazzy that was like a term that was said all the time on the pop sessions and that was just literally adding a third to the part they're like that's too jazzy so <laughs> like you gotta you gotta know what is um you know what people are looking for know what's um what's selling and uh, mm -hmm. on that popular world but um on the creative level like when you are working with someone like uh flying lotus you know it's mm -hmm. on it's on some deeper spiritual stuff totally. and totally. um music language doesn't um convey into it it's a it's a deeper thing that um that artists are looking for these days. And um, so yeah. that, again, that's that coming from here. Um, yeah. If someone is rushing you in a session um, and you're creating something, then they need to take a break and yeah. let you go get a drink of water and come back and do it again. Um, yeah. As a horn player, we have a right. We have a right to do that. They hired us mm -hmm. because they see us as the master of our craft. So then, mm -hmm. If you're not feeling that the that it's set up for it, then um, it's up to you to reshape how that's done. And that then that's definitely difficult for a younger musician. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I think talking about younger musicians. I mean, I I 
I, you know, I, I've seen what you've done. And I'm wondering, like, how do you go in there? Because to, to, to tell you the truth, I know a lot of people from New York who went in there, did the session with such and such person and left and had, you know, had no clue of like, what, how much are they getting paid for this? <laughs> what's the royalty situation? What's the, uh, you know, what, uh, what's the credit situation? Mm -hmm. And then this thing that they recorded for free turns up on the biggest album of the year and they have no idea. So like, how do you navigate? Because, you know, you're going in there and you, you, you want to be yourself. Like you said, you're putting yourself out there. You want to be giving all you have. So how do you navigate the whole financial portion, the credits, the, the royalties, whatever, the back end stuff to make sure when you do go in there, it's all chill and cool. You know what I mean? How do you navigate that? Yeah, well, I, I've been fortunate where I've had a uh, representation um, for a big chunk. Um, but going back to the time before that, um, it's really, it's difficult. <laughs> and um, like I've always, I, I learned my, how to approach that stuff, luckily from some old Jamaican musicians and- um, Bye, 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 bye. Yeah, um, you know, be at, like being in high school and being on a gig where a musician, horn player leaves, with the knife in his hand to go get it that was paid, you know? But um the, Boy, the only the, only a Jamaican, I you know, it sounds like a Jamaican to me. Yeah. You know? <laughs> the lesson like to be learned though is like you you all that has to be taken care of ahead of time. And there is nothing wrong with that. And if somebody wants to give you shade or give you any beef for you uh looking out for yourself to know what you're gonna, um, what you're getting yourself into, then you, sh you should probably shouldn't be working with them anyways. And um, they're gonna go find somebody else and that person, that group of musicians probably won't work out for them. So, yeah. um, but there's a lot of um, education that needs to be still, like the, the AFM, the American Federation of Musicians um, mm -hmm. do a, horrible job of <laughs> breaking this down uh they hate me by the way so I, I'm, I'm totally okay with speaking out uh, against them um because because there there really is no place for all this to be um acquired this knowledge so mm -hmm. um really get to know uh more seasoned musicians who've been in it people like hit I have so many musicians hit me up because they're in a situation and mm -hmm. they're not sure what to do. I'm grateful that I know, I, I, I'm not a master of all of it, but you got to know what you're worth. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't want to do mm -hmm. stuff through the union and the union has become quite spineless that uh, you don't, people can hire musicians and it doesn't have to be through the union. So you have to have your union stuff down and know how the union works. But at the same time, you have to know how to negotiate for yourself if it's not union. And that means that you're not getting um, residuals. So you need to up your, like I'm always like up your worth mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're not doing it through a AFM contract. Um, get much more yeah uh, because they're going to ask you to sign a work for hire which essentially you're just giving everything that you created to them so if yeah. you if you wrote on it make them pay for that if um but really um if you're writing and creating material um you deserve a writing percentage if it's a little horn part even even 2.5% of a writing split is better than nothing. Hmm. Um, I just had, I worked with someone a couple months ago where they wanted me to arrange a bunch of ideas and um, offered me $200. And I was like, well, you know, how about we, I, I like the money, you know, like I'll, how about we, 
do some splits because I'm contributing. And this guy had the nerve to say, well, I don't feel that the horn parts are adding too much to the song. I'm like, then oh why, like, why are you getting them? He's like, you're just following the chords. And I'm like, yeah, you wrote the chords. I'm not asking for like 25% of the song, but like if I'm adding some like little sprinkles on yeah. that, that's exactly. a new idea that you did not come up with. Yeah, so exactly. you, you have to learn how to advocate for yourself. And that's really tough for any instrumentalist because uh, mm -hmm. we're put in such a vulnerable uh, position of like, well, well, I'm going to go find somebody else. Yeah. And um, back to the, the reason why I brought up that I was fortunate to have representation. If you can separate the creative from the biz, if you are in a, position to do that it really makes things so much better and then there's obviously there's there's a trick where um you either have um a friend call and be your your uh lawyer or manager or you just um change your voice a little bit and call them as somebody else like yeah. there's um there's many different ways or create a different email at like that mm -hmm. like I've done all these things where like a before I had representation where I didn't want to I didn't want me to be involved with them on the biz side because I wanted to really pound for like what I was worth on that thing so I created a, di a different email address mm -hmm. represented myself as somebody else mm -hmm. and um was able to finagle that and it made life so good because I was the creative part, which is the most, most fun and important part was, was a gem. Right. So, um, but you know, how does a horn player in this day and age give away a percentage to someone to do that work for you? That's a, that's the most difficult thing, but hopefully things get better again. And um, I know like there, there are people out there that want to represent horn players and string players on sessions. Um, if you're doing a lot of work, then it's worth it to someone to take 10 uh, to 15% of your earnings to administrate everything because it, the credits, like mm -hmm. how many times do we record something for somebody and then we're not even credited on it? Yeah. That's like, yeah. the, in like, those credits actually get us residuals, no matter what, if it's union or not, through PPL in the UK and mm -hmm. sound exchange, what a joke, in the US. <laughs> um, so there's the credits, your money, and then um, if there's a back end, how to negotiate that. And that's a real tricky side. And all I would say is if you're if you're creating any little bit, you deserve a percentage on the writing. They aren't gonna give you publishing. They don't want you to own any bit of the master, but if you can get some of that writing, that's a, that's a big deal. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, what you just described is, is huge because I even learned a lot what you, what, from what you were just saying. And I kind of knew bits and pieces, but just putting it together like that, I mean, that's super helpful to people. People are so scared to ask for what they want, to lose that opportunity that they lose everything, you know, yeah. and they just give, give, give. So that is major. So I want, I want to talk. Oh, wait, can, go ahead. Can I say one other thing on it? Like, yeah. um, some, like we, we lower our worth because we're afraid we're not going to get called back by that artist, right? Yes. And um, oh, wow, I won't say who the artist is but um hired me and i was able to put together big sessions and it's like decent budget and they're they're pretty frugal with their their money they're conservative but they take good care of us but then um on a second project hit me up and wanted a bigger section for less money and i was like no not gonna do it and like all right well um thanks and then they went and got a different section that would do it at a much lower rate of horn section that there there's always horn sections moving to LA there's it's like they coming in like in 
buses, you know? Yeah. And they'll do like the $50 session for a mega millionaire artist. So they did this <laughs> session. This is a pretty well-known horn section back then. I don't know where, where they went during all this. They're kind of quiet, but uh, that didn't go so hot. And that artist ended up coming back to me for wow. the next one. And now it's, it's one of the um, handful of people that like is a steady client, which is pretty, it seems like it's back in the um, heyday, like in the 50s, 60s, 70s, even 80s, there were horn players had steady clients. But mm -hmm. in the day and age, it, um, it's, I guess the might, it's, it's pretty rare for us to have a plethora of steady clients. So I'm really grateful. Yeah or this, that artist to come in back my way. You yeah. Know? yeah, I mean, that's huge. I mean, I have also experienced stuff like that. And like at a certain point, it gets so horrible that you're like, I am not gonna offer anyone I know this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just embarrassing, right? And if you, if I, if you can't understand that, I'm trying to explain to you in a logical way, then by all means, you know, it's just not worth anybody's time. Right? Or the, the people hitting me up these days looking for uh, brass players to play in-person sessions during a pandemic. And, and I'm, like, yeah. I'm like, I'm sorry. Like, I do not know anybody that will do that. Yeah. So maybe, maybe call the union. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. I mean, it's insane what people come up with, you know, um, but... I do feel like in some ways it's because like you said, there's always a horn section. There's always players that's going to say yes. I feel like it's, it, it, it's so hard for us to come together as freelancers, right? That's what we yeah. are really to, to join up and say, Hey, let's not take any gigs below a certain price. Yeah. And, you know, we try to do that in New York with this tuba, this tuba thing, because people were again, really upset. We had this Facebook group we, we created you know, that we're like, hey, did you get a sex message from this guy about this parade that's three hours long and he wants you to do it for 80 bucks? <laughs> and we're like, yeah, we all got this text message. And we're like, okay, let's let's all gang up here and tell this guy, this is the new rate. You know, and if anybody accepts, I mean, this is the kind of not so fun part, but we're like, if anybody accepts it, we're going to find out who they are and we're going to tell them, hey, you do, don't play that, don't play the gig. So I, that's really hard to do. When yeah. your freelancer like kind of gather everybody yeah. up and say, "Hey, don't take this gig," mm -hmm. but I feel like there has to be something like that because, hey, like you said, the unions don't do it for us. They don't help us. They don't tell us what's the price for, uh, you know, an hour gig uh, for a horn player in 2021 in 20 or in 2020. Yeah. You know, no one's telling us this information, so we're the ones that have to do it for ourselves. And I yeah. think that's the disappointing thing is that there will always be someone else. And granted, th they might not be the cream of the crop. Right. So thankfully, maybe the smart, the smart ones will come back and say, hey, you know, can you we'll do what you wanted us to do. Right. For the payment and all that. But a lot of times it's not that way. Right. Yeah. So it's it's such a tricky thing being being horn players in this kind of sense, you know. Um, but any that's a that we could have a whole conversation. Yeah. <laughs> about it. You know, we could have I mean, but. I wanted to get into maybe to, I know the, the funny thing is like, I feel like there needs to be like two parts to this interview because there's so much that there's so many questions I have for you, but I know that we're like already like close to an hour, we're hitting an hour, but I wanted to ask you, so, you, I mean, you mentioned that you've done work with films, but I kind of wanted to ask you something a little bit different. Um, I saw that you worked with Stone's Throw, which, I love, I love Stone's Throw. I kind of geeked out about it on the East Coast because I love people, basically how I got to know about Stone's Throw was, you know, through Madlib, but also through mind design and, people, mm. you know, people like that. And I was like, man, if I could, because, you know, my wife, she, her family's from LA. So we come out here for Christmas and I'm like, I just want to go and visit Stone's Throw. Like, can I do that? Like, well, you know, um, so, but you, you've done work with them. Like they, they brought you into it with a few people, but there's one project that you worked with, you worked with Malib, which he kind of, I remember this, he kind of did this live kind of group, like a, a quintet or something like that live. And 
he the thing he's a bit mysterious you know he's kind of he kind of is always just he's there but he's like no one really knows who Madlib is or like this that's how I feel mm -hmm. um but I you know you know I, he plays a ton of instruments and he plays drums uh so just really quick like in that experience that you had you know playing and I think you also arranged as well like for this group how, how was it working with someone that is kind of like uh mysterious but really well known and kind of has this like you said his whole love for music is like in this he protects it it seems it seems like he's protecting his love and how was it working with him he he's incredible um otis jackson jr um to me he's like a, a big brother um got to long before um working with him like that, um, just to get to hang with him, watching DJ um, and just talking about jazz and her love for music. He's just a real special, real sweet guy. Mm -hmm. And um, at times he will be enigmatic and a mystery. And uh, he actually um, helped me like, he. Through him, I learned the power of that, and like you said, protecting your your music in a certain way, and um, that there's something to be said about that. Like there should we people don't need to know everything about us, and um, that mystery can be tapped into the music that you make, and um, that's something that I I've always been in tune with. Um, through, through Madlib. Uh, when we started working together, it actually was, um, it was hilarious because I was just supplied to him. I mean, he supplied me with some instrumentals and he wanted more live instrumentation on it. Mm -hmm. And um, luckily uh, we, through that process, we were talking through Egon, who was the label manager for Stone Throw at the time. Mm -hmm. um, to go back, I, Egon and Stone Throw and Peanut Butter Wolf helped put out the um, some early Breakestro stuff. So, and I was a part of the original Breakestro, and that was my how I became close with the Stone Throw family, and then. Um, after moving back to LA from New York, because I was in New York for a couple of years, when I moved back to LA in 2002, um, Egon was really starting to do a lot in Stone Throw. And uh, I was a part of a project called Connie Price and the Keystones. And that, so it became this, we were the like instrumentalists that would be directly called if anybody in the Stone Throw family needed live instruments. So um, it, we already had a sound and we had something going. So when um, Madlib reached out for the, it was the Funky Side of Life record, the sound directions, um, I was given carte blanche. Like, and I was like, get on the phone with him and he'd be a totally different guy than he was in person and like super short and like all over the place. I was like, all right. He's like, just do your, just, just do your thing, man. Like, that's mm -hmm. what I want. And it came up all right cool you know i'm young and still kind of green and want to impress and um so uh, i did what i felt was right sometimes i if for some people don't know he created the yesterday's new quintet which was really um it's all him and so each person had its own character name and um I was doing that with the L. Michaels Affair in New York, where we would play different instruments or even playing the same instrument, playing in a different character. And I brought that back out to LA with the different things. And I have like different monikers and different recordings with like five different names. Like I have like my French horn player name. I have like wow. my my like coked out disco trumpet player name. <laughs> and like like all the like the the characters. So um, when I got deep into the music, I try to imagine like like all right Malik Flavors is on this one so like and try to fit my insert myself into the situation and that's where it worked and like the stuff that I wrote for that record 
so a lot of it wasn't isn't really what I usually would write and I like a new characters came out of that and Otis like he ate it up he like he caught it and he loved it and um when it came time to perform it live for the first time he played drums and um he was super nervous like <laughs> only other time he had played live in front of people was he did something in um London with most deaf and he got on drum set and was playing drums and most deaf was like rapping mm -hmm. and um but this was like Mad Libs music he's playing drums and we had Phil Ranlin and like all these insane musicians like on stage and mm -hmm. uh he played his butt like crazy <laughs> Uh, oh, we man. Did a, wow. did a cover of uh, David Axelrod's A Divine Image and um, Otis is doing like getting this Earl Palmer vibe on and I think we closed the night out it was sold out like pack show and mm -hmm. uh, as soon as we we're he he played so amazing um, after at, right when we finished he like got up and like we hugged each other over his drum set and mm -hmm. his, he was shaking Oh my gosh. Like, you yeah. know, that one, if you're for a creative musician, when you like tap into like the upper realms of, of music, like yeah. he hit it and he was, he just couldn't let go. Cause he's like, he like was, he never experienced that. And he's yeah. like, he's like, dang, like that's what you guys are going through all the time. <laughs> and yeah. um, yeah. it's real profound, like so profound. Like I, I forever love him. I got to work uh, extensively with his brother. Oh No, who put out records mm -hmm. on Stone's Throw. Mm -hmm. um, oh No and I did an um, orchestral concert with Red Bull where we got to rework um, the music of um, Claire Fisher and David Matthews. And like, he was just amazing on a whole different level, like a polar opposite of talent of um, like his brother and um, I, I have a, a record from um, Mad Lib that I, I need to finish that like from years ago, that on an old Mac G5 that I, yeah. that I need to tap into um, that I, I'm bringing back up to, uh, to take care of because um, his music, his, he, his sense of jazz is like anybody else. Like to me, he's like a modern day monk because yeah. like monk was so forward thinking and um otis is coming from he's created worlds um that no other jazz musician i mean i actually just dug up these records because like he has all these different combo records like that's yesterday wow. from Tet, yeah. and um, they're like kind of like, like that's the mod miller record mm -hmm. Um, Ahmad Miller plays vibes, flute, and synth, you know, like he has yeah. all these different people and like, who does that? Yeah. Well, um, the only other person is um, Gennaro Jarrell and he isn't really doing that type of stuff anymore, but like we need more people to get out of their comfort zone and, and yeah. make, they, if you can make jazz on your own, you're yeah. in isolation, like there's no better time than now. <laughs> for real. For yeah. real. I mean, I want to bring up the pandemic for a second, and maybe this is how we'll close out. Is um, you know, I was listening to your record, Easy Okali, and um, I was listening live from the Blue Whale. And I thought to myself, I, I was reading the description, I thought, wow, this is really cool. Uh, your friend recorded this without you guys knowing. I mean, yeah, you're right. I could feel the textures. I could feel I felt like I was just sitting there in the cafe or in in mm. the venue with you guys. It felt super intimate. It felt super vibey. And I just feel like it transported me to a whole different place. It didn't feel like LA. Um, it felt it felt super different because there's this mix of like Ethiopian and also I felt like you said like Latin vibes too. And anyhow, I loved the record. And I was just wondering like I wanted to get your thoughts on because I saw that the blue whale is closing, right? I mean, they're they're gonna be closing their doors. They already did. They already it's, did. So, like, I mean, you recorded your record there. I mean, how does it feel? I mean, I know that's a staple in LA um, because last Christmas, not this, not this past Christmas, but the Christmas before, I wanted to go and see Justin Brown play there mm -hmm. around Christmas time, and 
I didn't get to go because because of all the you know whatever um and so that's the first time I heard about it so how how do you feel like with this pandemic and all all the things that so many people have been going through two things how do you feel about the fact that such a big part of your history this venue is now closed and on the flip side what's a gem that you feel like you found in this pandemic that you didn't at all feel like would be possible? Yeah, well, to lose the blue whale is, um, it's it's being stabbed through the heart. Um, that place was a temple for us, um, for even outside of the Ethio Cali group, um, so many other combos. Um, looked at that place as like our our spiritual home to make the music that we make. And um, um, this, I, I, I have faith and there is gonna be, there are gonna be some venues that pop out. Um, I, to be honest, through the pandemic, I've, I've really stayed home. Um, I really um, tried to, I'm really playing it safe being a father. And mm -hmm. um, so I don't know of any new places that are gonna come up, but um, they're like, I'm in love with the uh, Miracle Theater in Inglewood. Um, they but, like had opened up like the year prior and um, that's a beautiful space. And I think is gonna be a home for uh, a lot of LA Jazz. Um, I know that Apotech, uh, which is a, a place for that I, I've had a weekly um, through talking to them, they're in good standing and they want to help um, be a home for jazz as well. So um, the, the loss of the Blue Well has hit the city so hard that I even know of um, venue owners and um, like production companies, like they had such a love for that place that they're um, trying to find uh, a physical space for June Lee, the owner of the, of the Blue Well to continue yeah. what he did. So um, the city, LA, just like many other cities, like it's really unifying in a, in a real um, special way. And um, I think that, that there will never ever be another Blue Whale. And um, after losing other venues that I loved growing up in both New York and LA, um, we, I've learned that we just gotta start something new and uh, it will never be that what we have, but we can build on it and hope for something better. Um, so um, it will be there, uh, yeah. so, but, for now, it's just the mystery is when, and um, for us being horn players, you're safe. A tuba spreads the least amount of aerosols than any other horn instrument, so did you're you, good. How did you How did you figure that out? Um, is it because it's wider, or how there's, did you there's data? I'm part of um, a statewide and national wide um, arts education network, and. Yeah. Um, research was done at the US level and I believe British level and so mm -hmm. uh, we we looked at it and um, like yeah the the tuba holds it in you know uh, yeah there's so much space in the belt or it yeah. just like stay kind of gathers there and doesn't go there in your area <laughs> where the, the trumpet is just like <laughs> 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 so maybe maybe the tuba will become more of a, a solo <laughs> instrument through all of wouldn't, it. Wouldn't that be like the the thing? That would be oh my god! That would and be hilarious. All, all the trumpeters are gonna try and find all the flugel bones, but <laughs> you know, and Ray Mason found them all. So <laughs> <laughs> Ray Mason is the king of flugel bones. Yeah, yeah, man. Oh yeah, the flugel bone thing is outrageous now, but it's great. It's great. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm so happy. So many people are just finding this joy in this instrument. I mean, I love it because it's yeah. like, it's so handy, you know what I mean? And it's like tuba, you gotta like, where is it? Is it in the corner or yeah. is it in the bag? I gotta take it out. Yeah. So tuba is great. Party horn. 
the party horn, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm talking to Ray. I'm like, uh, Ray, let me let me do this real quick. I'm like, Ray, we gotta create a T-shirt. Let's create a Fugabone culture T-shirt. Like, so maybe we'll do it. <laughs> I don't know. But I think it's like it's such it's I don't know if they write anything about brass band history or something in in the history books, there has to be like a Fugabone trend section. Yeah. A moment. A moment. Definitely. Yeah. Um, but this was great, Todd. Um, let me let me try and like, focus myself right here. I, yeah. probably, I have this like it's the golden hour in my. my I know I see it's beautiful though. It, it was <laughs> it was like in the in the shot a bit, but it was. Yeah. Beautiful. I was like I was like look at LA, you know. <laughs> LA is showing off right now. <laughs> Thanks so much for checking out that episode. We're gonna have more hustle and horns coming to you with fantastic musicians out here in Los Angeles. This is a Pedal Note Media production. Shout out to the Brass Junkies. Until next time, y'all.